Hi everybody, thanks for being here for the 1980s Rangers Roundtable. We've assembled six of the Rangers greats from the 1980s, a decade that had its uh, highs and its lows. We'd like to introduce our distinguished guests. We have Larry Parrish on the end there, a two-time Rangers MVP. An American League All-Star in 1987, led the club in home runs and RBIs three different times. Next to him, we have Charlie Huff, six-time Ranger Pitcher of the Year. <laughs> the Rangers' all-time leader in wins, in innings pitched, and a million other things, and a member of the inaugural Texas Rangers Hall of Fame class in 2003. We have Pete O'Brien, who was the Rangers Player of the Year in 1985, and who had more hits, I don't know if you even know this, and more runs than any Ranger during the decade of the 80s. He's Mr. 80s right here. <laughs> Ruben Sierra, a member of the Rangers Hall of Fame. <laughs> Ranger Player of the Year four times. Uh, an All-Star three times. Sporting News Player of the Year in 1989 when he finished second in the MVP and certainly Probably. should have won. We'll Probably. talk about that a little bit <laughs> later on. Uh, Jeff Russell, a member of the Rangers Hall of Fame. The Rangers Fireman of the Year in 1989 and a guy who made the All-Star team as a starter in 1988 and as a reliever in 1989, second on the all-time Ranger list in games pitched and in saves. And Oda B. McDowell, Ranger first round draft pick who was the Rangers Rookie of the Year in 1985, <laughs> made the Topps All-Rookie Team and was the first Ranger ever to hit for the cycle. So if we want to start chronologically in 1980, uh, at the start of 1980, of these folks, I think I'm the only one who was actually here when the season began, but Charlie came during the season. Charlie came from the Dodgers, uh, who had been in the World Series in 1977 and 78. You come over to a franchise that had never won anything. What was that like for you? It was quite a shock. If you can remember, 1980, I came from California with the Dodgers where with night games, it's nice and cool. Got here and I think it was a record setting stretch for July 1980 where it was 110 a day every day or whatever. <laughs> I, I thought I was sent someplace awful. And, then, <laughs> and to tell you the truth, I ended up loving it. I mean, I, I really felt it was a great place to play and I thought it was really especially good for me when I got a chance to start here. Pat Corrales was the manager yep. when you got here, right? Well, what was it like playing for him? Um, fun. You know, we work together now. Uh, we both work for the Dodgers. Um, he's doing pretty good. So I just saw him last week. Uh, to say he was my favorite manager, maybe <laughs> not because I didn't pitch that much. But, uh, no, he was a good friend. Yes. And then so in 1981, Don Zimmer became the manager. Yeah. Uh, you became a starter that year. Well, late. Late in the in year? In September, actually. That was after the, we had a strike. <laughs> <That was> the, <laughs> we had a strike It took me a little while. Season, it right? took me 13 years <laughs> to get a, a shot at it. Yeah, yeah, that was, see, we played a third of the season. Yeah. We had a two-month strike. Yep. And then came back and played the last two months. I got five starts in September. And so what yeah. was that process like? Were you lobbying to be a starter all along and finally they listened to you? Or had they run out of other guys? <laughs> well, I think it was more we ran out of guys at that stretch, but... Uh, no, I mean, it was just kind of a break for me. We had a few guys got hurt. And I think he said, I, I remember saying to him one night, if you give me a chance to start, I'll win 15 games or I'll quit. And the next year, I ended up pitching opening day and I won 16, got a little lucky there. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, no, no, I mean, he gave me a chance. It was throwing a knuckleball, it's really tough to get a shot. And it took me a long time, but I was really happy to get it here. Now in 1982, because the Rangers almost made the playoffs in 81, we were all very optimistic going into 82 that this might be our year. And a couple of trades were made in spring training, including bringing in Larry Parrish and Dave Hostetler from Montreal for Al Oliver. And I remember changing leagues for you was, was a big deal at the time. There wasn't any interleague play. It was, it was kind of a shock, right? It was. It was uh, uh, much different at that time between the leagues, uh, a lot of difference in the umpiring. Uh, you know, the, the National League would, you know, were like they today, you know, where they wear the, the shield underneath, but they, they tend to, got, you know, the, the umpires got lower behind the plate. 
and they called the low pitches, uh, where the American League umpires still had the balloon, and they were standing straight up, and they wanted to call this pitch. Well, I didn't like, you know, I didn't like to hit this pitch. I liked that ball down low, you know. So that was, uh, you know, and uh, it was an adjustment there with the umpires in the strike zone. Uh, I had just found out that I needed uh, glasses, and uh, that spring I wore glasses, you know, and I had a great spring. And, uh, you know, we got out here to start the season in night games, and I couldn't see anything but just lights and reflection everywhere. And uh, I wound up, I had astigmatism in my left eye, so they were trying at that time, trying to find contacts that would stay in place. And I went through uh, like two months going to the eye doctor every day here till they finally come up with a weighted contact that it would stay in place so that I could see the ball. But I'd be up at the plate and I'd blink and then all of a sudden I couldn't see and it was like, oh, Jesus, you know. Yeah, that's, a bad, that's a bad feeling, you know. <laughs> On top of all that, you'd been a third baseman. You come over here and they tell you now you're a right fielder. What, what was that like? Yeah, that was, uh, you know, in fact, uh, I had played with Jackie Brown, who was uh, Zimmer's pitching coach at the time, you know, and uh, we were actually playing uh, the Rangers in the, in the spring down there in West Palm Beach. And uh, we had, uh, and the Braves and the Expos at the time had, you know, were playing the games on the same field, but each had their backfields that they, you know, did their work on. So we were back on the backfields and we'd, uh, you know, took batting practice and all, and we're walking, as we're walking in, we'd come by Jackie and, uh, you know, and he he mentioned something about uh, you know how would you like to be a ranger? And I was like, ranger I was like you, you guys got you know buddy playing you know. And he goes, well, uh, we're gonna you know we, if we can get you, you're going to right field. And I was like, oh, gee. and I think they made the deal that day. So uh, and it was uh, it was you know it was. Uh, uh, a, little, a little different uh, because, you know, I'd always played third, you know, and you thought you were, uh, you know, that that was, I, I guess, home to you. It'd be like a pitcher, I guess. It was like Charlie, you know, going from wanting to start and playing in the, you know, in the, and pitching out of the bullpen or whatever. But uh, I think uh, uh, I really didn't have, a, you know, a big issue with it, though. You know, to me, it was just a matter of, uh, uh, you know, Try to do the best you can out in the field, and then you get to hit, you know. <laughs> and, and you're hitting now in a ballpark that did not exactly favor power hitters like yourself. It was, uh, you know, at the time, the, the old ballpark, uh, you know, you had the wind that came in every day from center field. And if you, were, you know, if you hit it on a, you know, if you hit it on a line, you know, you could get it through it. But if you got any air under it, man, that thing would just go up there and the balloon would come out, you know. And there was, there was times that you would, uh, you know, I said a lot of wor bad words about that old stadium, <laughs> yes. Remember, the, the club got off to a terrible start. We had a road trip where we lost every game. And at the end of the road trip, Eddie Robinson, the general manager, got fired. Uh, later on in the year, Don Zimmer, the manager, got fired. But in the meantime, uh, we called up Dave Hostetler and he just went off on a tear. <laughs> you, had you played with David Montreal or had he just been in the minors? No, he had been in the minors over there. I mean, I had seen him and uh, I knew that he had power, uh, but I didn't know, you know how complete a hitter he was. And, and, uh, and when he came up, you know, he was you know big guy, you know, and, and they were trying to throw, you know, keep the ball away from him. You know, he was a big guy, so we just gonna throw him away. And man, he was thinking, launching it, you know, <laughs> regular. And then, uh, but it, unfortunately, one of the pitchers threw one in. I don't, know by, yeah, I don't know about by plan or mistake, but it was like, uh oh, we found him. And, yeah. you know, and then after that, you know, Haas. Okay, so he was a first baseman. You called, got called up later on in the year, and you became the first baseman, right? Yeah, it was interesting. When, uh, when Haas came up, it was about middle of the year, I think. It was in June or something. And uh, we were alternating in Denver. He was playing first one night, and I was DH, and then we'd flip. And then he got called up, and um, he was hitting one a day. I mean, when I'm just watching ESPN, and they just kept playing the Bonanza song, right? <laughs> dun, 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 dun. And he was hosh, you know. And I just looked at Rich Donnelly, the uh, AAA coach. I said, "Hey, 
you need to put me in left field. I got to go get somebody's job, maybe. And uh, so I played the second half of the year out in left field. And then I thought, well, I mean, Haas is going to be here a while, so I need to find another position. And I didn't have the arm for right field, and LP was out there, I guess. So, uh, and Samp was in left, and he was doing great. So I was, I was busy coming up. And it was, uh, but that was a shock to, to, uh, to the system when I just told Rich, hey, put me out in left, fine. Well, and Putnam and Bass had come down to AAA, so they had plenty of first basemen, so that's what he did. And you had Mickey Rivers next to you in center field a lot of the time. <laughs> what, what was yeah. it like playing with Mickey? Mickey was fabulous, you know. <laughs> I remember one day he goes, hey, Pete, it's so hot here in Baltimore, I saw a dog chasing a cat, and they were both walking. <laughs> 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 right? But Mickey was great, yeah, and then George Wright was coming up, you know, Georgie was there, and, and uh, <clears throat> I ended up playing a little left field in Seattle, too, at the end of my career, and I remember Griffey coming into the dugout, or into the clubhouse, seeing me in left field, and he'd come over and he'd say, hey, Pete, just stand on the left field line. I got everything else, all right? <laughs> just don't run into me. <laughs> you know, and, and somewhere there in the early 80s, the Rangers became the first team to hire a full-time conditioning coach. A guy named Mike Fitzsimmons came in, and, and all of a sudden things were a little bit different for you guys, right? Yeah. Um, yeah George Dubay actually is somebody that came in. I think Fitzy came in after or before. Yeah. I'm not sure, but um, George Dubay. You know, weightlifting was starting to become, you know, really popular there. So I think all the clubs were starting to get involved in that a little bit. Now, after the 82 season, Don Zimmer got fired late in the year, and Daryl Johnson finished out the season as an interim manager. And then the Rangers hired Doug Rader. And did you guys know in spring training in 1983 that things were going to be very different with Doug? <laughs> well, I, I had played against Doug in, you know, when he was a player in the National League, and there was legendary stories of, about Doug. Uh, uh, and uh, so when, when, you know, when he was hired as manager, you know, your first reaction is, this is, go this is going to be fun. <laughs> or it's going to be different anyway. Yeah. Now, I remember when um, your wife gave birth to your son, Josh, uh, Tim Kirkjian was the reporter for the Dallas Morning News at the time, and uh, Doug told the media one day that Jenny had given birth to a son, and Tim said, well, what was his name? And Doug just said, Buford. <laughs> and Tim put it in the paper. <laughs> and all these people are sending LP, congratulations on the birth of <laughs> Buford. <laughs> but Doug had this really fiery temperament. Was it that way in the dugout during the games, Charlie? Well, I never noticed that myself. Well, you were in the back <laughs> smoking somewhere. Yeah, you know, yeah, I, I might have been hiding with a cigarette somewhere. But, you know, it, he was great for me because he left the pitchers alone. Unless maybe you're a reliever in a close game or something, but he... He hardly, we hardly ever talked. I mean, just, he would say, how you feel? You all right? He'd walk to the mound. You okay? Yep, I'm good. And he'd go sit down. So he was fine for me. But I, I know he got excited with the, with the players. Oh, boy. And that's, that first season, 83, we had a great first half. I think we were in first place at the All-Star break. And as would happen a lot in those days, there was a fade after the All-Star break. Do you, do you guys think that the weather would have something to do with that in those years? Did you guys get worn out? Um, I don't know. It, that's a tough question. I mean, I really enjoy playing in the heat, and uh, but I guess maybe it probably took its toll may, maybe more on the pitchers than the players. We started getting smart. I mean, you know, as hitters, we, we would kind of take our BP and maybe bow out of infield and, or something. But it was, uh, it, was, it was hot, but I don't think it probably affected the players, the everyday players, maybe as much as the pitching staff, you know over the course of the year. Well, 1984 was a terrible year. We, we want to move past that with one exception. The last game of the season that year, Charlie pitched it against Mike Witt of the California Angels. And what wound up happening was a perfect game. Um, you guys, I believe, were both in the lineup that yeah, day. Yep. Um, was he just something special that day, or was it just one of those days where everything you hit went at somebody? He was real special, I'll be real quick, because Charlie came in and I think Reggie hit a ground ball to me for a uh, fielder's choice in the first inning. Yeah. And Charlie came, we, we all came back in, he goes, that might be all they need right there. <laughs> <laughs> I remember telling the pitching coach I came in after giving up one run, going, I think the game's over, I don't know if we're gonna get any hits. And 
It turned out, I think our rally was a 2-2 count. <laughs> he, he was unhittable. I've watched it a lot of times. Yeah. That was also the only run of the game. Yeah. It was a yeah, chart that loses nothing. one to nothing on a ground ball out yeah. in that ball game. The game was played in an hour and 49 minutes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You don't see that much anymore. So then in 1985, the club gets off to a terrible start. And in the middle of May, uh, Doug Rader gets fired and Bobby Valentine gets hired. And one of the very first things that happened, I remember we were in Chicago, was Odeby got called up. Yes, it did. And I remember you came out, I think you played the last game of that, that three game series. What do you remember about coming up to the big leagues for the first time there? Well, Eric, I, I try not to remember that. <laughs> but I was called up and I remember going into Chicago and the Ozzie Guillen was the shortstop. And I met him out while we were doing batting practice. And he came up over to me and I played against him in the uh, Junior Olympics. And he came to me and he says, you're that guy with that funny little stance, right? And so uh, during that game, I forget the pitcher. I know he was a left-hander. And I think I uh, impressed everybody. I struck out four times that night. <laughs> <laughs> but Bobby stuck with you. I remember he, he was committed to playing you, right? Yeah, um, he did. He called me up. And uh, at that time, I think Tommy Dunbar had got injured. And we were playing somewhere in, uh, uh, I was down in AAA. And he said, hey, you, you, you're being called up to the big leagues. So pack your stuff, got up, said, okay, I'm going to the big leagues. And like I said, the first night, first night of the big leaguer, that's what I did. But uh, it was a great thing. He stuck with me. I think I went 0 for 31, first, first 31 at best, I believe. And my first hit was uh, <laughs> a dribbler against Kansas City to uh, first and second, I remember that. So that was a big hit, so that was a big start. <laughs> you know, the whole atmosphere was different with Bobby. You know, it, it was great for us in the media because he was extremely talkative and you know, very quotable. Uh, what was the difference for you guys in the clubhouse when Bobby took over? Oh, it's a big difference. I mean, <laughs> I had known Bobby since he was 18. I mean, he signed a couple of years after I did with the Dodgers. He was the, the number one pick, like, in the world, a football player out of Stanford, Connecticut, and we became actually pretty good friends. Bobby had a tough time communicating, I think, with some of the players. I think he's brilliant, but he had a tough time communicating what he wanted done. I think he'd be a fabulous manager today. You know, with all the numbers that are involved in the game, I think he'd be great. For me, he was a lot of life. For other guys, it could have been tough. Yeah. He was really tough on the umpires. And as I recall, they kind of turned on our hitters, right? We, we would not get a lot of borderline calls because yeah. they were so upset with Bobby, right? I would agree with that. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, there were some umpires <laughs> I came up through the minor leagues with that I liked. And... Uh, and then, you know, as the year or two would go on, and, and, and Timmy McClellan was one of them, Drew Coble, and man, they did not like Bobby. And it, it, didn't go, it didn't go well. I mean, it was kind of, you better be swinging the bat with two strikes. Yeah, there was that crew, um, Rocky Rowe and Vic Voltaggio, Larry Barnett, I think, was on there, Greg Kosk. Yeah. Those yeah. guys, we could not get a call, yeah. you know, once Bobby came in. The other thing, Bobby also, he brought in Tom House, and all of a sudden, you guys are out there throwing footballs. And we're doing it today now. How about that? He, it's Tom amazing. Was... A lot of things he brought into the game didn't, didn't work out right then. But the conditioning has changed for pitchers. Um, all of that stuff is in action, in play today, and even more so. The conditioning for the pitchers is tremendous today. But what was it like when Tom showed up and told you guys, this, this is what we're going to do now? Well, I kind of said something like, no. <laughs> I don't want the ball to spin. I don't want to spiral. Um, no, I could understand it. But basically, I paid attention to everything he taught. And it was not my style. I mean, I couldn't do those things. It was closer to a power pitcher, like Jeffy's going to throw real hard and a hard slider. Well, that kind of throw figured for it. But for me, it was pay attention to the delivery work, the leg work. But the arm and stuff was totally, totally different. I remember at one point a reporter asked you about what the pitching staff would be like now that we had a new pitching coach. And you said we would lead the 
lead the league in first down, third down conversions. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Except for me. <laughs> yeah. Now, Jeff, you came up that year, right? In 85 is when you came from Cincinnati? Yeah, I got traded for Buddy Bell. Trade for Buddy Bell. So first of all, you're a Cincinnati guy. Buddy's a Cincinnati guy. And you get traded from Cincinnati to the Rangers for Buddy. What was that like? Buddy was probably the only guy on this team that I, I knew of, um, other than maybe Toby Hara. Um, being in the National League for those few years I was, uh, growing up in Cincinnati, you just didn't get much in the paper about the American League team. So when I came down here, I knew absolutely nobody. But it was still, it was fun. So it, it was a learning curve for me to try to learn uh, the new hitters in the league, for sure. And coming over and having Tom House as your pitching coach, was that extremely different? He, he really got um, my career started. He got down and sat down with me and my wife and got me on a nutrition plan, first of all. Um, I was a little pudgy. And then uh, actually got me throwing the football, which I loved because I was a quarterback. And then uh, the weight deals. I mean, he was always getting us up on, a, on the road at 10 o'clock and be down in the weight room. So it was a good structure for me, for sure. And what, what was the welcome like coming over in the middle of the season there? And again, replacing a guy like Buddy on the <laughs> roster. Here, kid, here's the ball. <laughs> Let's see what you can do. And uh, it was rough because I remember my first little outing against uh, Toronto and at that time Toronto was had they had some good hitters and I was coming out of the National League and fastball league and I was throwing the ball by several people but not that Toronto team yeah <laughs> yeah and 85 it wasn't a great year but 86 was 86 was the magical year um, in spring training Pete and Cavillia made the team uh, we went with three rookies in the starting rotation Jose Guzman Edwin Correa Bobby Witt uh, Mitch Williams had come over that year too, and then I think right at the beginning of June, Ruben, you came up, right? Came up. And had this huge series in Kansas City. What, what do you remember about your, your first time in the big leagues that year? Well, when I was in AAA, they were telling me about a week, hey, uh, I'm going to you, I'm gonna talk to you, uh, you have a date today? No, 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 I'm going to be in the room, so I'm going to call you, we were. So they got me like a two week with that, you know. Yeah, they didn't bring me up. So one day in Indianapolis, they, they call me about one in the morning, 1.30. And they, uh, you know, they, uh, they Oliver, he was the manager in AAA. So he come over and he called me at the room and told me, hey, uh, come to my room. Okay, so when I hang up, I say, yes, <laughs> I went over there. <laughs> and he told me, hey, um, congratulations. You're going to a big, you have to go to the ballpark and get everything. So when I get to, to Kansas City, and I see all this big guy over there, you know, I, I was a little scared, you know? So I say, you know, everybody say congratulations to me. But really, wanna, I want to say thank you to Larry Paddy that he was hurt. So that when they <laughs> called me up, <laughs> he was hurt and Gary Ward was hurt too. So they give me the chance to come up to the big league. And uh, now that I got a chance, I say, hey, I'm not going to lose this time. I got to stay here. <laughs> So. And, and you didn't speak any English at the time. In fact, that, well, I started learning Spanish in the late 80s so I could talk to him <laughs> without a translator. But Jose Guzman was here. Yeah, Jose and Guzman, Edwin was, Correa. Um, and Ray Ramirez. Was yeah, Ray trainer. Ramirez was a trainer, yeah. Right, all from, all from Puerto Rico. So did, was that important to you in, in making it easier? Yeah, you? I mean, yeah, because uh, when I do anything in the, in the game and the sport writer, they come over, so... I had to look for one of them, you know, to whatever they ask me, you know, tell him in Spanish so he can tell in English, you know. But that was the way it started, you know. And as I recall, too, I mean, you had a big series in Kansas City that week. And in another year or two, you had a series in Kansas City where you hit two inside the park home runs in a span of, of three days, something insane like that. Was that the ballpark that was the most fun for you to play in? But let me tell you, every time I get on um, third base, I remember the 
George Brett used to play third, but and then he moved to first. And every time I get into the first base, I say, hey, why us, man? Why <laughs> us? You know, every time, every time I go over there and I raise my average. So I go there hitting 300, and I live in there hitting 350. So, so many interesting things happened that year. Inky hit the ball in spring training that went through the fence, or at least John Blake said it went through the fence. It made a hole in the fence. Uh, and Inky wound up making the team, and I think hitting cleanup on opening day. Uh, he had never played in the minor leagues. Uh, what were you guys thinking in spring training when this guy shows up and, and is going to play in the big leagues without having played in the minors? <laughs> I tell you, he was a surprise for me. I mean, I love the guy, and he hit the ball. I remember throwing batting practice to him one day in Pompano Beach in the old ballpark, and he wasn't hitting the ball especially well. I'm throwing fastballs. I guess it's not fast enough for him to hit, really, but I'm throwing to him, and he hit ground balls by the screen by me, and I had never heard a ball go by me so hard. Ground, ground balls, just you would normally say, oh, okay, that's to the shortstop. They were scary how hard he could hit a ball. And he ended up, I pitched against him in my, he was my only out in my last start pitching in the first day, he swung it one over his head. <laughs> but he ended up being a heck of a hitter. And he was a great kid, I loved him. I'm glad you mentioned that ballpark in Pompano. Oh. And Larry, you're, you're a Florida native. What, what was it like playing in that? They called it Pompano Municipal Ball Field. It wasn't, they weren't even making believe it was a stadium, but what was it like to play there, to hit there, and, and the playing surface there, to oh, try it not was, get killed? It was horrible, uh, playing surface. Oh, it was. Uh, uh, it was a mixture of about four grasses. You know, they had crabgrass, some Bermuda, some Bahia, you know, and uh, you know, anybody on the infield, you know, you had to, you know, at any, at any ground ball could, you know, dot your eye, you know. It was, uh, and the clubhouse was, I mean, when you pulled up, it was an old wood, uh, you know, clubhouse, bleachers, you know, and I mean, it was, you know, it had a little uh, Muni airport, you know, where the right. little Cubs were taking off over the outfield wall and coming in, but uh, uh, the, uh, but the thing I remember, uh, you know, the things you remember, you know, sometimes aren't baseball things, and, and uh, Pete and I were talking about it a couple days ago, was, uh, you know, we had a, we had a huge fan that just passed away here the last couple of years, and Charlie Pride. You know, and uh, so Charlie w at that time would come down to spring training with us, you know, and he knew that I liked uh, country music and, and uh, we had a, the team was on the road. We didn't have to, we didn't have to make the, the trip that day. So we were, we were there for a workout, and, you know, and we took batting practice and all. And anyway, I went to, out to the outfield shagging, you know, he calls me over, says, LP, I got, uh, I think I got one coming on, you know, he says, I got two verses to it, you know, and he, he sang me the two verses. And it's like, Charlie, that's gonna be a good one, you know? And he said, I still gotta get the third one. So, you know, we, we finished up that day and we went to, like you said, we had just, we had just got into weight lifting, weight training. And, and uh, so we were working out after the, after the practice. We came back to, you know, take a shower, and Charlie's in the shower, and he goes, LP, I got the third verse. And he sang the third verse to me, you know, in the shower, and, you know, the song goes on to be a, you know, big hit for him. So, you know, that's one of my fondest memories of, of you know, when I think of Pompano. It's a, one, one of my best memories of Pompano was talking to Dick Allen, who Eddie Robinson brought in one year as a special hitting instructor, and he loved you, and he would just, he spent, 15 minutes telling me what a great hitter you're going to be. Wow. Did, did you work much with him that spring? You know, I, I don't recall. I think probably a little bit. Eddie Matthews was down there too at, at one point, but uh, that's, that's pretty good if Dick Allen's saying that about me. I don't think I quite met his expectations. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, later on, um, uh, Sandy Koufax came to spring training one year uh, when we were over in Port Charlotte. Did you know him from before? From when you were oh, with yeah. the Dodgers? Yeah, Sandy Koufax is, he it was actually the first guy, I was gonna have to make an emergency start years ago with the Dodgers in San Francisco, 
And me, I, you guys know I used to mess around a little bit throwing a real slow, 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 slow knuckleball. And he told me before the game, he said, why don't you throw that in a game? I said, what are you, crazy? You know? <laughs> and I found a spot. I happened to get to a spot with two out, nobody on, and a pretty good hitter at home plate. So I said, well, I'll try it. And I threw it real slow. And the guy hit a, just a grounder to third. I was shocked. I was as shocked as he was. You know? And uh, I started using it. I used it for a long time. Wow. But I mean, it took the greatest fastball pitcher in the world to get me to not throw it as hard as I could. Now, the one other thing about that Pompano training complex was that the, there were only two fields. There was the stadium hmm. field and then that other one that they called That the wasn't Evo a Gima. field. That was not a field. <laughs> and I remember Mike Richard once getting hit in yeah. the face. He was, he was going to be our starting second baseman. Do you right. guys remember when that happened? Uh, I think that was probably... I was on the stadium field. Oh, yeah? yeah. yeah. I was Ooh. pitching, by the way. No kidding? Yeah. yeah. I, got, I tied up a game in the ninth. I, had a, I think it was a nine-run lead. And I got the win in the tenth. That's not good. <laughs> and and I cost the second baseman the yeah. starting job because he got hit with a bullet. Yeah. You didn't want to go to Iwo Jima with Twig, right? Yeah. Oh, Twig would just keep ripping yeah. you fungos all day. Yeah. So the '86 season, again, it started out well, didn't end so great. You guys had a great rivalry that year with the Angels, and I remember even. Um, I mean, there were actually even fights that that year, if I remember right. Uh, involving the Angels. Do you remember anything about rivalry with them or with any other team during that time that was more heated than with anybody else? I don't remember the rivalry, but I remember going into the final uh, week of the season where we were battling to, when we finished second and we uh, ended up finishing second. But uh, I, I recall uh, Witt was pitching and uh, he was, he was uh, pitched a great game that time too. So. And I was injured in that final week of the uh, season anyway, but I do recall that. And the next two years, 87 and 88, were pretty bad. But one of those years, you led off the season with a home run in Baltimore. And then the, the very first at bat of the season, do you remember that? I remember that. That was off of uh, Mike Bodiger. And I think um, Toby Hare also hit home run during that, uh, uh, that, that first game of the year. And it was very cold there, so uh, hit the ball out in left field. And Mike Boddicker is a pitcher who threw a lot of off-speed. I didn't like the off-speed pitches. And so fortunately, he threw a fastball and uh, got pretty good wood on it. And I remember Bobby Valentine says, well, that's a good indication of a good start for the year. And uh, it was a pretty good year overall. So, yeah. And then a lot of things changed in 1989. Um, the ownership changed in spring training. But in the meantime, the Rangers had traded for uh, Julio Franco and Palmero. Rafael Palmero and signed Nolan Ryan. Nolan Ryan. And they turned you from a reliever into a starter, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, but what was your reaction when you heard that the Rangers now had Nolan Ryan? Oof. Well, that was uh, one of my childhood idols for sure. And uh, to be able to participate in games with him and play on the same team, it's phew. Yeah, it was awesome, and uh, just the way he went about his business helped me, you know, understand that if I'm going to pitch for any length of time, I have to start doing that, what he's doing. So he was a good, good teacher for us. When Julio and, and Rafael came over, that, that must have been great for you to have two more, two more great Latin stars on the team. Yeah, I mean, uh, Julio, he was the guy that, that had more experience than us, so... Uh, we always worked together. We always went to the cage and started, you know, working and hitting, soft thought, this, that, ready. So he always take it from your hand, you know, and let's go over there, let's work, let's work, you know. So he helped us a lot. And then the, the ownership changed in spring training and George Bush's group took over. Were you guys really aware of that or did that not make a difference to you guys at that point? I don't think it made a difference to us. Um, I just remember <clears throat> Rusty Rose, who was a majority owner, or ma I guess minority owner with him. Um, we became really good friends, and he would always have us out to the ranch and go hog hunting. So there, I'm warming up in the bullpen. It's, you know, a two-run game or something, and I'm 
here, and here comes Rusty up the stairs of the, of the, the bullpen, and he goes, hey, did you kill any hawks? And I'm sitting here warming up, ready to go in. But that was the first time that I ever had any kind of a relationship with ownership. And it, was, it, it made us feel good as a, as a team that we could go to guys like that if we had a problem. You know, and Nolan comes in, and I think like in two of his first four games, he took a no-hitter into the eighth inning. Was it special for you guys on the pitching staff those days that he was pitching? It was just sit back and watch, you know, because you knew he was going to be out there and be competitive every game he was out there. How about playing behind him? Was it exciting playing behind him with the possibility of a no-hitter every time? Everything, everything was good, and he was throwing no-hitter down the ninth inning <laughs> with two outs. In, in Toronto that day. I remember in Toronto, yeah. he was throwing no hitter into the ninth inning. And uh, I think they, they bring uh, Nelson Liriano, I think right. it was. Yes. And he hit a triple. You know, he tried to, to go by him, you know, with the fastball. But the, the, the guy was ready, so, so he break the no hitter. But play with him is a little tough when he was you know, when he, nobody get hicks in the game, you know, <laughs> because after, if you don't get him after the fifth inning, never mind, because he was going to be tough to hit him, you know, seven, and he will throwing hard and hard and that's it. So I he, never, I never see a pitcher like that, you know, never. He had an amazing season. Went to the All Star game. You went to the All Star game. You wound up finishing second in the MVP that year. All of us were really upset. We thought you should have won the MVP. What, what did you think about that? Were you expecting to win or, or not? I was waiting for the answer. Um, I think I was going to win because the number don't lie. But they, you know, they judged me because my English was not the best that time. And because I didn't speak English, sometimes they made fun of me, any words I say, and, and I don't want to talk to them because that, and they take that against me later. So yeah. I think at the end of the season, after that, they, they vote and they... <laughs> Take that. <laughs> See, and it's the writers who vote for the MVP. The players vote for the Sporting News Player of the Year award, and Ruben won that award. So the, the players themselves, you know, knew who had really had the best season that year. A lot of people say that I win, but I say, hey, for me, it was a great season. I hope uh, we have a team to be in the playoff World Series because that's what I want. But you know, they went later when I was out of the Rangers. Right, and your whole time here, well, the first time around with the Rangers, you played for Bobby. What was it like for you with Bobby Play as with manager? Bobby, well, for me, he's the best manager I've ever played. Why? Because he brought me to the big league. He <laughs> gave me the chance to play. So if he didn't give me the chance and that guy don't get hurt, and <laughs> guy was, I was in AAA, maybe I, didn't, I don't know what's going to happen. You know, but if he gave me the chance and I take it, you know, and then he was good. You know, he played me every day, you know. Sometimes he get on me like, you know, like anybody else, you know, because if I do something wrong, you know, I have to learn. So I got to, you know, listen and, and do and try and not do the wrong thing. <laughs> And then very late in the 80s was when Juan Gonzalez first came up to the big leagues. Did you know him already from, from Puerto Rico? I don't know him from Puerto Rico, but because he, he was a, a friendly guy, he was, you know, Puerto Rican guy. So I take it from the hands, you know, and take it with me, live with me. You know, I don't let him pay uh, rent or nothing, you know, just live with me for two years, you know? And then when I, you know, when I left Texas, I let him leave where I, where I was living, you know? So one of the things, you know, back then, things were a lot looser. Um, there wasn't as much preparation before games. There was a lot more fun in the clubhouse. I want you guys to each to th try and think about things 
that you can publicly talk about that were really, really fun in the clubhouse. I remember one day Bob Brower bringing in a snake. Do you, do you remember, do you remember that? Am I yeah, imagining no, that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Hey, Julio Franco bring a tiger. The tiger. Uh, Pet Bengal tiger. He chased, he chased this guy, uh, what's the name? Uh, yeah. Dougherty. Yeah. Remember the outfielder? Yeah. Jack Dougherty. Dougherty. Oh, Jack Dougherty. Yeah. yeah. He, he was chasing him all over the play in the clubhouse. Yeah. And then there's a one day, the last game we were going to play in Chicago at Comiskey Park, it was a Sunday and it was raining and they were going to play at our place the following week and so they didn't want to rain out the game because they knew they'd have to play it at our place and we had a, a seven hour plus rain delay. Do you guys yeah. remember that? I remember. Yeah. We in Chicago. Me, and, me, me and Bobby Witt went out, we, we put, uh, we, we, still had, we still had our pants on, our, our game pants, but we put our jacket on and we... Went to a little restaurant bar and had some <laughs> some lunch and <laughs> came back. <laughs> yeah, and, and the game never it never got played. It eventually got rained out. I think the league got involved at like eight o'clock at night. It was that's not the clubhouse you want to be locked in for seven. Yeah, it hours. was tiny, right? Cool. Yeah, it was horrible. Yeah, all of the clubhouses back then were were nothing compared to what they are now. What which were the worst ones? For you guys, Detroit. <laughs> Detroit. 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 Detroit was bad. I mean, and America. Boston yeah. wasn't so great yeah. either. Yeah. Boston. Cleveland. I remember we played in Cleveland. Ah, Cleveland. Oh. We played in Cleveland one time when they, they was like uh, right now was a you know the, the you know the excessive heat was reaching up north, and it was in the you know it was a hundred degrees, and the old clubhouse in Cleveland you know they're not used to the to having, you know, yeah. being hot. The only windows they had were just right up at the very top of the clubhouse all the way around. You know, and the clubhouse guy there, we, we get there, remember Bill? Bill Sheridan. We get there and, and Bill Bill's already, I mean, he's, he's like four, <laughs> he's already had four or five beer, you know, sitting in front of the fan, you know, and he's like, and it was like, you couldn't get anything that day. I mean, Bill was like, I, I'm right here, you know. And uh, we, it was so hot in that clubhouse. I remember we went to the dugout to change, and it's 100 degrees outside, and we went out there to change our shirts that day. That's how, how hot it was in that old clubhouse. Yeah, I remember Detroit being really hot. So hot one day on a Sunday afternoon game that Mark Holtz, my broadcast partner, took his pants off and he did the whole game in his, in his undershorts and nobody could see. We were kind of tucked in there in a little cabin and Holtz, he did the whole game in his undershorts. And in Detroit, we were so close to home plate, we could hear what was being said at home plate. And Charlie had that game where Gino Petrali had six pass balls which was a record. Who Gino? <laughs> and, and every time Gino would come back to the screen to retrieve the ball, the expletives got louder and louder. <laughs> and a few of them, I think, got on the air. What, what do you remember about that game? Was your knuckleball particularly good, or was it, he particularly it was, off? It was particularly good, and Gino, I love Gino. He, he probably caught me more games than anybody I ever pitched to. I loved him. And that particular day, I guess, it was a day game, so the, there was some white on the bottom of the scoreboard. He was explaining it to me. There's a strip, and every time I let go of the ball, it was coming for him down. If you're hitting, you're looking at it a little different, yeah. but it was coming right out of a scoreboard or something, and he said, I lost every ball. And I can understand, because he caught me great. Yeah. And that particular day, everything, I, it was moving good, but it, it was hilarious. I mean, it, it was funny. I mean, it was one of those games that you lose and you go, that was kind of fun. <laughs> you know? I think he broke every light and uh, all the light bulbs on the way to the club. Yeah, it broke all the little light bulbs you said on the way to the clubhouse. Yeah. yeah. Another game that really stands out for me was your near no hitter in Anaheim. You had to mention that, huh? I had to. I was actually, I'd actually gone down um, to do a post game interview yeah. with you and there wasn't any place for me to stay, so they actually let me be in the dugout, which I think was the first time I was actually ever in a dugout during the game. And I was looking right down the left field line when that fly ball was hit that George Wright, who had just come in mm -hmm. for defense, didn't make the play. But when that ball was hit, you thought it was an out, right? Well, yeah. <laughs> hey, you know, he, he, he catched that like 99 out of 100 times with no lights on, and he just dropped it, you know. 
one of those things, and they ended up scoring a run. But I, re I remember the end of the game, I struck out uh, George, no, oh, George Hendrick on a 3 2 knuckleball with runners on first and second, and they're going. And he, he swung and missed, ball got by Orlando, and I stood about 10 feet off the mound going, okay, throw it to first, throw it to first. And he didn't throw it to first, he didn't have it good or whatever. And the runner from second is rounding third, and he's about 20 feet from home, and I'm going, idiot. <laughs> you know, we lost, I lost the game on the strikeout, totally my fault. And I remember, he, I don't think Orlando ever came into the clubhouse after wow. that game. I mean, it, it, was, it was heartbreaking for him. It, for me, it was a stupid play on my part. And, you know, I, I was tough to catch, that's all. <laughs> I knew it could happen, you know. Yeah, I remember your, your All-Star Game experience. Was it Rich Gedman who tried to catch yeah. you in the yeah, All-Star Game? Yeah, another one of those games, yeah. He retired yeah. him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He totally retired him after yeah, that Yeah, when you get taken out of an inning after, you know, after your third strikeout, and you're still out there, you go, something's not quite right. Yeah. yeah. You know, a, a good story along with that game that he pitched in Anaheim, uh, that was on a Saturday night, right? And the next day, Sunday, they had a, a bunch of football players out there to play softball, right? And this guy, you know, had sat behind home plate and, and he was like, who's that guy that pitched for you guys last night? It's like, well, Charlie Huff, he's a knuckleball. He goes, well, he don't throw hard. It's like, well, yeah, but he throws a knuckleball, moves all <laughs> over, and he goes, I could have hit that. So then, you know, I get the guy over and I was like, Charlie, throw him one. Well, Charlie could, he could just sort of flip one and take all the spin off of it, but it wouldn't do anything. Well, Charlie threw him one of those, and he said, yeah, I could have hit that. And then, then he got Charlie. Then Charlie was like, give, give me the ball back, <laughs> you know. And now he threw him a good one. And when Charlie turned that thing loose, that guy was eyes wet <laughs> like this. And it hit him right in the, you know, in the sweet spot. <laughs> and, and I mean, down he goes. He don't get to play in the softball game. They have to take him up to the clubhouse, you know. Yeah, it's fine. That's probably the decade where I have the most vivid memories of individual things. And one of them was one night in Seattle at the Kingdom after a game. You were in a slump. And Holtzy and I were finishing up the, the post game show. And I remember looking down, and you were out at home plate, standing at home plate in your underwear with a bat. And I remember you telling me the next day that the home plate wasn't straight, that home plate was, was skewed off to an, an angle there, right? Yeah, and, and Detroit, the old ballpark yeah. in Detroit was. was turned to right center. Yes. And, you know, I, you, know you, you take your stance a lot of times, you know, off the plate, and you would get there, and you would look up, and the pitcher ain't where he's supposed to be, you know. It's like he's supposed to be over here, and he's back over here, and it's like, and you'd step out and you'd try it again, you know, and it was like, it was just, and, uh, you know, the guy in Detroit, uh, I wound up coaching there, you know, and I talked to the groundskeeper about it. I was like, why do you, you know, and he goes, we've always had great left-handed hitters and with the plate cut like that, for some reason, it's great for the left-handed hitter, so we have never touched it. Did you like hitting there? Loved it. Yeah. I mean, I could walk in there 0 for 30 and like, I'd come out there, you know, outfield, 10, that for, old place, yeah. 10 yeah. for 5. That was a big old outfield yeah. at that place. You know, there's just ballparks, though, that are like that. Uh, you know, I, I don't know for the pitchers, but there's mounds like that, but there's, there's definitely batter's boxes, you know, where you could just, you just step in, step in there and it's like, you could not be swinging good and you could go to that ballpark and go, all right, I, you know, I feel good here. And there's other stadiums where it's like, you know, I just, you just feel, you know, you feel off before yeah, you ever see the pitch. You know? One of the hardest balls I ever saw hit, and again in Detroit, the broadcast booth was so close to home plate, you know, we felt it more, but uh, Pete and Cavillia hit a ball there that went off the center field wall on the fly. It was 440 feet, right. and he wound up with a double. And it, I mean, it just absolutely crushed. But I guess we're just about out of time, so I want to thank you guys so much for being here. Odeby, Jeff, Ruben, Pete, Charlie and NLP, thank you so much. Thanks to all of you for being here. Thanks to all of you out in uh, TV land for watching. Thanks a lot.